I'm here to present Stan Marshall, coming from the West Coast, from the state of Oregon, <laughs> a 31-year veteran with Georgia Pacific. Stan is a consultant who partners with companies and solopreneurs, you can ask him about what that means, to improve their management of supply chain activities after spending nearly three decades, three decades plus, yeah. uh, working in supply chain for a multi-billion dollar company. Well, I let the cat out of the bag there, Stan, sorry. That's all right. Uh, Stan knows what truly drives value-added activities, improve reliability and supply chain improvements. It's all about how well you connect with the vision of the company and the people you're trying to help that makes us successful. Stan believes that every organization can better utilize resources through the use of technology and business processes. Stan, 31 years implementing solutions that improve the competitive advantage of the company. He's a lifetime certified purchasing manager through the Institute of Supply Management, holds a bachelor's degree in management and communications from Corbin University. Go Oregon. All yours. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Thank you. So I'm going to be a little different than everybody else. I have little note cards to kind of keep me on track. and everything but one of the things I'm going to do a little different too is this is a practical application of RFID and a material replenishment and repair and operation type environment so um, I'm going to ask, ask stop at certain points and say do you have any questions about what we had covered at that point because it's kind of broken up in about three or four different sections so with that um, and when you ask questions just raise your hands please speak loudly and uh, we'll try to make sure we answer those as best as possible. So let me give you a little background first. Um, even though I've got the vision here, I want to talk a little bit about the problem statement. We've heard a lot about that today, about identify what the problem was. Well, spending 31 years in this organization uh, that was a manufacturing organization, and they had small and large facilities every place from facilities that would have 100 employees up to 1,500 employees with inventories of uh, maintenance and repair and operations of $2 million up to $33 million at a location. And one of the things, constant complaints I always would hear from our maintenance and operating personnel is, you don't have the part we need. It says, the system says we have it, how come you don't have it, right? How many of you have ever heard that before from your operations? Yeah. So the problem was, okay, why is that? And how do we solve that? And when we started to look at the solutions, we look, I started looking at this about 15 years ago, and when I presented to the company at that time, it was a lot more expensive than what it is today. And because of that, they said, well, there's no really return on investment. So we started, I, I kind of let it lie for a while and kept looking for processes to improve everything and to get it better. Um, but about three years ago, finally said, you know what, after looking at this technology again, I started looking at a whole uh, variety of companies and what we were trying to accomplish. And one of the things that was critical is we had to find a company that was very flexible, that would integrate with our ERP system, which was asset suite, which was made for the nuclear uh, industry, which is very rigid. So we had to find a company that would be willing to do the programming integration for that and help us develop this so they would uh, apply in a maintenance, repair, and operating supply environment. And quite honestly, most of the uh, companies I approached wanted to sell us their kind of box cookie cutter system and it would not apply. Um, when I did approach barcoding, I will, I'm gonna give a little kudos to them here because the first thing they said is tell us what you want what you want to get out of it will help you get there. It wasn't, here's what we're selling. And the other thing that they did, they talked about investing up front in our organization. Before we actually had funding approval, we asked them to do a tabletop experiment with us to come into our facility, set up a temporary setup, and show us that it would actually function and work appropriately. And they did that. And that was a big help in convincing our leadership to invest in this experiment. And that's what it was for us as an organization. It was an experiment. So our vision really was to improve our reliability of our machines, and in this case it is a pulp and paper manufacturer, but we wanted to improve our reliability. 
our efficiency, our parts management, parts tracking, and reduce our overall cost. Now, like with any project, you have to have a couple metrics to measure. For us, cycle counting was a big one. And what we had to do is we, all the cycle counting we did, we did annually. We counted every part once, only once a year, because we had to physically count everything. And we had to do it on overtime. It was costing us thirty to $40,000 a year at this location. The other thing is we had a lot of uh, maintenance and operating personnel looking for parts. They'd come in and say, hey, I need this part. They'd be looking for it. They'd spend 30, 40 minutes and everything. So they weren't very efficient. And if you have mechanics or electricians, they're the highest paid laborers in your manufacturing facility usually, and you want them doing their job. You don't want them looking for parts. So some of the benefits that we expected to get out of this was increased inventory accuracy and to be the ability to do that cycle counting in an effective, efficient manner. One of the bets we made was to reduce all the overtime that we had seen for several years we had been paying for. And then the other thing is we were a, because we had narrowed down our organization in our stores area, we had four employees. They worked a Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 3.30 shift. But we were a 24-7 operation. So that means people had access to our storeroom after hours, and our process was you fell out of slip. It was all manual. And if they didn't do that, we wouldn't know they took apart until they needed it the next time. And I'm sure everyone's had that, op that experience, too, in your organization where something's supposed to be on your shelf. It's not there. They go to get it, and then they go, our machine's down, or we can't run, or we have limited runability. And it costs us, and it impacts our profitability. So one of the other bets on this or benefits that we expected was to monitor all those overnight ex um, transactions, the transactions on the weekends, and make sure that we knew that they left. The other thing is we wanted to increase our storeroom personnel effectiveness. And part of that is because we only had four people. And they were doing some transactions that were not very value added, quite honestly. And we paid them pretty good money. So we wanted to make sure we did something that would increase their efficiency and give them a little bit more pride in what they were doing, too, in their job. So some of the things we were looking at were kidding delivery and parts tracking and the ability to locate parts in general areas. Now, why did we do all this? Really, it was because we needed to improve as an organization. Very large organization. I'll, I'll just say that um, it was, you heard it was Georgia Pacific. We've been around a long time, and we heard it earlier today. Well, we've always done it that way. Guess what? That's true. We've always done it that way. And so we had to make a major change in the, in the process. We wanted to do that through the use of technology, and we wanted to make sure that um, it would be effective and efficient. And what I found out from doing a lot of research is there's not a lot of locations or outfits out there that do it on maintenance, repair, and operating supplies. They do it on chemical tracking or uniforms and things along that line, but not to this extent. So we were kind of going to be the experiment or the first one to try this. So I want to give you an example here of some of the parts that we were doing. The first one on the left there is a large pump. And you'd think, you can't lose a large pump, but you want to know what? It does happen. People will come get it. They don't say anything. If you only count it once a year, if you counted it February 1st and they took it out February 3rd, and then they need it again July, guess what? That's probably a 18-month lead item, which means you don't have the part. Or it might be, yeah, it might not be quite that long. It might be only a five-month or six-month lead time, but still. They come and get it, and now you have a machine down, which is costing you money. On the other side are a bunch of the smaller parts that we'd keep in our storeroom. And so, you know, those are the MRO storage um, applications that we, we ran into in our facility. So some of the, um, excuse me, some of the things, challenges, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, that we ran into is, okay, when we start this process is what can we tag with RFID tags, and what can't we? And what are the criteria around the items we cannot tag? So one of the things that we came up with is, 
if our system had a unit of purchase or a unit of measure that we, we bought something in, and I'll use an example, we'd buy a roll of rope, we bought it by the rolls, but we sold it by the foot. We would not be able to tag that, because you can't tag each foot of the rope, right? So we had to figure out how to segregate those items. Also some very, very small parts, we would also have to segregate. So we actually went through our entire list of what we call catalog IDs, and we had a roughly 33,000 catalog IDs, 15,000 of them were on hand at the time, and discovered there was about 600 of them we had to put as non-RFID. We had to leave that as a manual process during this um, experiment. But we also segregated them and gave them different colored labels and made sure we trained people appro appropriately on that. The other challenge we had around some of this was uh, all of our shelves were metal and we were really concerned about how's that going to affect the, the, the reading of the RFID tags. And what we discovered was it actually helped because the frequencies would bounce off the shelves and read the tag in the back. So it, that was actually a positive thing. Um, the other, some of the other criteria on the RFID was, like I said, size and maybe just the ability to tag. Sometimes we just had small stuff that we just could not tag it. Um, so we tried to look to see could we make it vendor managed inventory or could we stock it in a different manner. But not everything was that way. So we had about 600 items that fell into this category, which was a small percentage of our inventory. So we, after looking at all that, we said, guess what? This is a good way to move forward. And we segregated it into a whole separate area, labeled it so it said non-RFID, so when people came in, they knew the process was a little bit different. So some of the other things we had to do, um, this is what we kind of installed. We had to install RFID portals, which were the new wave portals we bought through barcoding. We had three buildings. Our main storeroom, which contained the majority of our small parts, which was roughly, probably out of our 15,000 items, probably contained about 10,000 of them. And then we had a large items like motors, and, and we're not talking small motors, we're talking 1,500 horse, you know, or and above motors. And then what we call a critical spares building also, which were large impellers, large pumps, and large pieces of metal um, equipment for the facilities. So we had three buildings. We had to install RFID portals for each of those. We also added badge readers for access, and we had to install Wi-Fi. So we weren't necessarily set up for Wi-Fi in that area. Um, and then we also had to go through and tag all the locations. We had to re-tag all the locations for every item, and that was 10,000 locations within our facility. So, you know, that, that was very extensive, and you have to remember trying to do this with four people on a 24-7 operation, and by the way, that was also during a time when we had two major outages, each of them for three weeks each. So, um, that took us approximately two and a half months to do that re-tagging, just of the locations. And then the other thing we installed was use of the handheld computers. And that was used mainly, we could use it for cycle counting, for locating, we could do it for issuing and everything else. Barcoding helped us a lot on that. So um, that's kind of what we installed in everything. Any, any questions around kind of the vision, what we were trying to accomplish, our problem statement, and kind of the system we installed or anything at this point? Yes, sir. How did it help with efficiency? How did it help with your um, efficiency? Like, did it speed up operations? How did it help with our vision? Efficiency. efficiency. Oh, efficiency. Sorry. Okay, so one of the, two of the metrics we had to measure was the cost and reduction in overtime, and the other thing was our efficiency around our mechanics, because those were things we were measuring. To try to tie them to our reliability efficiency was kind of difficult, because not all issues were um, related to parts, and to put a dollar value to that and measure it on a consistent basis was difficult. But we could do that with our mechanics, because well, our mechanics track their time. Every, every minute they're on the clock, and part of their, one of their codes was no parts. So we were able to take a look, and we had a baseline already for 
when they had no parts and when they had to go look for parts and stuff and then compare that to what the end result was. Did that answer your question? Okay, good. Yes, sir. Yeah, how did you deal with uh, items that you needed to know who took it? In other words, if you got 150 technicians and you got a couple of them in the room, uh, you know, so they, you know, so the RFID did fine to say it left the room, but if you need mm -hmm. to know who did, who took it, how did you deal with that? With that so I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but we, at the, each of the portals, we had a, what we call a thin client computer with a badge reader and a barcode scanner. And every person who came into the stores area was to scan their badge and they would scan the barcode on the work request or in our case, we call them material requests, and that would identify where the part went to. So I, that kind of answers your question a little bit, I think, there. Anything else around that? So this is just the initial system that we installed. Yes, yes, sir. How much was the cost for each portal? So it depends upon your mechanical and electrical work that you need to do. The portals themselves were roughly, I think, with all the cabling and everything like that, was uh, four to five thousand dollars. It depended. It depended um, upon the size of the portal and stuff like that. In our larger buildings, they were eight-foot high portals and not just the six-foot high ones. So roughly that. I'd say Frank is probably the best guy to ask on the pricing instead of me. <laughs> Okay, so here's the issuance gates that we, in our main storeroom. So one of them is the front gates, four foot wide. If you notice on the floor, it says no fly zone. When we installed this, um, barcoding helped us determine where the frequencies were reading, and then we painted an area. And as part of our training, we made sure that the issue section where the computer was and everything was outside of that area. So when they scanned everything, all they had to do is walk through the gate with the parts, and it read it. That was it. So we actually helped our mechanics and our operating people become more efficient. Instead of having to write a whole bunch of information down, which would take them three to five minutes to do, if they did it, then all they had to do is they had to use their badge to get in the storeroom to begin with. All they had to do is scan that badge, scan the barcode, and away they went. And that was very effective. And that idea around the barcode scanner actually came from my operating people and my maintenance people. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but we got them involved early on. So one of the things that made this very successful was to engage our operating maintenance people, not only our hourly, but our salary individuals, and had them buy into it. Now, we're a union environment. And the first question I got asked by the union, what do you think it was? How many jobs are you going to eliminate? That's the first question they asked me. And when I told them, not eliminating any jobs. We're just going to retask some people so they're more efficient. And they were all for it then at that point. So we, we did that early on. So larger items, this is in our motor storage and our critical spares area. You can see the doors are a lot larger, and if you notice, I think this thing has a pointer. It has some fabric on it, and that's because we did run into an initial issue, and that was those are metal doors, and the RFID readers were bouncing off those doors back into the building and kind of reading stuff out of that read zone. So we put some RFID absorbent material on those doors, and that resolved that issue. Uh, let's see. So cycle counting. One of our big bets was around cycle counting here. And as you can see, there's a lot of boxes and there's a lot of parts in each of those boxes. And those are all tagged, by the way, RFID tagged. And we already had installed in our process where every item that came in got tagged anyways. We just changed the type of label we utilized. So cycle counting, we had to manually count those all individually before. And with um, RFID, we, we still did random physical counts, but we were able to count items a lot more effectively and efficiently. And I'm gonna show you a little video. It's kind of here on the bottom right. And you can see the handheld face. It says 51 items to be counted, you know, and 51 expected. So you can kind of say, I wanna count this many items. 
and it will tell you which ones it did count and which ones it did not. And then you can actually go find them if, if that's the case. And hopefully this works. Okay, here we are. We're about to start our count. As you can see, we have 51 expected and uh, we're missing 51 and zero have been found. So as the operator starts pulling the trigger and the RFID handheld, pulls the trigger. And as he is doing that, he's waving it up and down as he's going along the uh, racks where we know that the items are. You can hear the beeping going on, and that beeping is telling us that the RFID tags are being read. And so he's reading all those tags as, as much as he can. And when we're done here, we're gonna go into the temperature control room where we know that there are other tags in the area. So to do a cycle count is a fast and easy process. So we're gonna take a look at the cam, at the, at the, uh, Hand, handheld here and you found you see that we have actually found 45 of the 51 we know that there's actually others that are in the temperature controlled room so we're going to head there now so this was one of the experiments we did right up front and it showed it to be very successful but I want to give you a better one so like I was talking about in this main storeroom we probably had roughly 10,000 items so we decided one day we we're going to take 7,000 of those items, 70% of our inventory in that main storeroom, where, which is the items that turned the most, and we're going to count them. We counted them in two hours, 100% accuracy. Think about that for a second. That normally would have taken us six to seven months to manually do. So now we're now cycle counting stuff on a monthly basis is what they're doing. Instead of doing once a year, they're doing it monthly. And then they're doing random physicals. There are challenges still around that, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but one of them around that, if someone comes in and their behavior is wrong and they take an item out of a box that's tagged, we won't know that. They can't tear the tags off. It, they're on there too well. The adhesive is really good and stuff. So, um, but I mean, if someone wants to bypass the system, they could. But we're going to know who went in, and, we, and all of our entrances have cameras also, so we know when someone went in and when they left, and everything is date and time stamped, so we would be able to see, hey, how come they took that part out and didn't get read? Gives us an opportunity to follow up at that point. So some of the challenges, some of the identification of items that could not be RFID tagged is one of them. Metal, how would it interfere? You know, large valves, bearings, machine parts, and stuff like that. One of the initial cycle counts we did in our um, critical spares area, we got all but two items, and what we found out is the placement of the tag, actually they put it on the, on the valve itself on the back side, so it did not read it. And so we went to a, um, a different methodology of how we tagged items. We went to a hanging tag instead. Um, Retagging the shelves, I talked about that. Um, performing pre-go live activities while stu still ha running a 24-7 operation. You know, all my guys still had stuff to do. Everybody in operations and maintenance had their jobs to do, and we're trying to implement this at the same time. Doing a full physical inventory. For us to do that, we had to bring 20 people into our facility, shut our storeroom down. Now, if you ever shut a storeroom down and you're still running your machines, you know that's not realistic, you have to track anything after that point, but it took us two full days to do that, full inventory. And we had some learnings even in the midst of that. And then training the education of the plant staff on utilizing the RFID process. How do you convince people this is gonna make their job easier? And we used a lot of video. We showed them how to utilize the system utilizing video. And we had what we call an ESI, which is an educational system that for all of our training within our company. And so we would know when someone went through the training. Uh, we also got a lot of feedback from all of our people. That was critical on, hey, what about this? What about that? How do I handle this? How do I handle that? And um, it was very, very influential in being able to make this a success. So, any questions around some of the challenges and stuff along that line? I'm kind of going through this a little quick, but... Okay. 
So what, what we installed also as part of our, what we call phase two was a kidding table and RFID portals at drop zones. So some of the work we had to do up front was a lot of mechanical electrical. We needed to make sure we had Wi-Fi in all of our buildings. And then we decided as part of the value added activities that we needed to do was to do kitting and delivery, which meant planners would schedule a job, put a, we would kit it together and then we would deliver it. And we had done that in the past and usually the big complaint was, well, someone robbed this part from my, my kit you know, last night and I didn't know about it and I don't have it for my job and so I can't do it or I'm halfway in the job and now a part's missing. We added on top of that some email notifications. So when we kitted something and delivered it to a zone, it emailed the planner or whoever was the owner of that material or work request that said, hey, all your parts are now in this drop zone and here's the list of parts. If someone came in in the middle of the night and took one of them, it would, the portal would read it leaving and it would email that same person saying, hey, this left last night. And by the way, here's the person who took it. So that he, they could follow up and say, did that get used on the job I was supposed to be planning on using it? Or do I need to get another one put on, back on that kit before I do the job? So it helped in our efficiency there. The kitting table is really for the small parts and then the handhelds, we use the handhelds a lot on the issuing and kitting also. So here's a couple of the drop zones. And again, they have a no-fly zone. And what that does is when we deliver it, we put them on the different shelves on the sides and stuff. When people take them out, they just walk out. There's no computer there for them to check it out or anything. All they have to do is grab their parts and go, and it will record it. Any questions around any of that? The, your no-fly zone, that is, in other words, no inventory within that no-fly zone. That is correct. If a part that was tagged went in that zone, the readers would read it. Anything else? Okay. So the kitty table, and this looks a little messy here because we were using it for an additional printing station right now, but there's actually a reader underneath that table and we cleared that off and anytime we kit it, we'd put bins together or a pallet and we'd run the small parts across the table and the larger ones we would use the reader, the handheld reader to kit it. And then as we left the storeroom, you saw the issue gates. If we went through one of those issue gates, it would read it as a movement leaving the storeroom, and then it would read it as a movement going into the drop zone. And that's when the email notifications would go to the, the owners. So here's some of the things we realized. Okay, increased inventory accuracy and ability to count efficiently. So before, depending upon when you checked our accuracy, it could be any place from 85 to 95 percent because you only count stuff once a year. If you factored in what we called stock outs, which means someone said, the system said it was there, we went and looked and it wasn't there, then it was probably closer to 80 percent accurate, which doesn't give your maintenance and operations people a lot of confidence. We're right now running around 98 and a half, 99 percent accuracy. And the 1 percent variance is really probably more um, somebody took it out and then brought it back in. It's actually we have additional stuff on the shelf, not less than what it says. So we're continuing to do deliver, um, training and stuff along that line. So again, I talked about the 7,000 items in two hours and then the ability to count them on a monthly basis or more often if we want. It depends. As we do it consistently, people will know that stuff is there and they'll follow the process and that's been what we've found. Kitting delivery, the parts tracking notification, that has been realized and that is a big benefit and all of our planners, all of our schedulers, operations people really like that. And then here's a neat feature, ability to locate parts. I, I got to give you a story here. We had two mechanics come into the storeroom and they were looking for this part in our utilities area. So for around the boilers and stuff. And, and it was a non-stock item. So in our non-stock items, we had a specific area of the facility in the storeroom that we kept those and we segregated them by areas of the mill. And each area could have 100 to 200 items in it. 
In the past, they would have to look through all those items manually and try to find them. So one of my storage clerks said, hey, what are you looking for? So I'm looking for this item. So he took his catalog ID number, punched it in the handheld, hit the locate function, pulled the trigger, and it acted just like a Geiger counter and told them when he got right there, they found it within 15 seconds. Think about that for a second. Now, instead of them spending 30 minutes looking for an item, now they only, they've got them in 15 seconds. They can go back to work and do what they want to do. A lot more job satisfaction for them. Plus, they were just astounded. Um, and then the increase in my storeroom personnel efficiency. It's, they used to be the old system during daytime they would actually go up to the computer and issue all the parts and actually go get the parts for the people. People would just come to the front counter and they'd say, I need this, and they'd go get them all and everything now. You know, and, and so they spent most, we had one guy that spent all his time, all he did was service the customers at the front counter, and that's it. And we changed that process where they could be self-service. So all they have to do is get in with their badge, go find their part, and believe it or not, they know where the parts are at because they've been around a long time. Scan their badge, scan their work order, walk out. They loved it. They don't like the weight on other people. The mechanics and operation people would rather just go do it themselves. And so that freed up a whole person to do this kidding delivery, also to do cycle counting during, during normal business hours, and then also freed them up to do other activities around our receiving area, and just in safety and other items. So some key learnings on this, and th these are critical. Need to have commitment from leadership. And when I say that, I don't just mean a facility or a company leadership. I'm talking about your operating and your maintenance leadership, hourly and salary. Okay, yeah, That is key. If they do not buy into this and they don't take some ownership in it, then what's going to happen is it will not work. I I'll just say that because they have to own it and realize it's for their benefit. Good communication to end users and training. We tried very early on to make sure everybody understood what we were trying to do and how we wanted to help them. Because operations and maintenance in our facility, they were our customer. And so what do we want to do for our customers? We want to make things as easy and simple as possible. Have a good change management system in place. If you don't, then you're going to get a lot of ideas. We've we got a whole board full of ideas. And quite honestly, we implemented about four of them. The barcode reader and the badge reader was one of them that was brought forward. They were low cost, inexpensive, and increased efficiency. Some of the others were like, probably not a good thing to do right now. Too much change at once. So, but we'll capture those and utilize them later on. And then this technology actually has additional benefits. Um, the company I work for has a lot of strategic suppliers. Probably 80% of the business we do are with those suppliers. Down the road, we're going to incorporate those suppliers in this process, have them tag stuff before they even get to the mill and to the facilities so that we can utilize it in our receiving functionality and increase the efficiency there also. And our accuracy too, because all that's manual right now. So before I do go here, any, any questions on anything I've covered so far? Yes, sir. Um, so, so the question was, uh, for the drop zones, have we identified any metals that would interfere with the RFID readers? Did I get that correctly? That's a good question. Because in one of the rooms, it was fairly small, and we had metal racking right there. So we actually put some of that RFID absorbent cloth on the end of that rack so it would not read back that direction. That was a good question. Yes, sir. Yeah, let me, let me ask this. These savings in... I'll say employees doing the work, uh, did they get absorbed in having to have people to make sure that the technology was working? Could you repeat that? Right, right. So uh, did you have to, um, in setting it up, so you had all of this RFID and, and Wi-Fi and all of that, did you, the people that you were saving from the standpoint of working, did they now have to turn into people who were making sure that the systems were working? Um, yeah, the, the one individual specifically that did all the issuing all the time, 
he became, he, he became a real big advocate for this once he saw the value in it. And yes, he does, every morning he would do double check to say what left that did not get issued to a work request or a material request. So there was a little additional work there, but minimal amount compared to what he was doing before. Stan, what, what, about your, what about your project team? Can you talk a little bit about who participated in your project team? Actually, I've got that on a slide, I think. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we had a project manager, um, which was an engineering um, um, person who really looked at it from an engineering point of view, from the cost benefit point of view, help us develop the ROI on it and stuff like that. Um, I drove the project myself. I'm the one that managed all the contractors, um, all the data comm interfaces, worked directly with barcoding and stuff. Then we had barcoding involved. We did have a little bit of design work due to some electrical and data comm work that needed to be done. So some outside PE type electrical contractors were involved. And then my stores team, and we had representatives from our hourly group from, and from our salary um, union group also involved. And they were involved in all of our team meetings, in our calls. I, have a store, I had a stores manager who was directly involved because in the end he owns that because that's his responsibility. But they were all directly involved. So. Any other questions? So some of the frequently asked questions are like, well, what did this cost, right? So I have to use the old adage, it depends. And the reason I say that is the integration portion was the most expensive part of this project, quite frankly. To integrate with Asset Suite was, was not inexpensive. We had to get our corporate IT involved. Barcodings IT were directly involved. And so it was probably half the cost of our project was integration alone. Okay, and the other half, we probably spent another quarter of it on mechanical electrical upgrades, Wi-Fi upgrades, and then a quarter of it was the actual hardware and software from barcoding. So depending upon your infrastructure, it, it kind of depends what it's going to cost. For us, it was right around $400,000, which when you think about that, that's, that's a lot of money. But if you're saving $40,000 a year and 25% of your mechanics have more efficiency, which accounted for us about $250,000 a year, it was about a one-year return, roughly. We, were, we figured it was going to be a one-year to 18-month return, which isn't too bad for an ROI, especially on an experiment. And that's what this was, an experiment. Say, will this work? This is going to go across, our, go across the company. They're, they're already working on doing that. And so the savings at other locations are going to be a lot higher because there's opportunities around labor reduction and things along that line. Let's see. I want to thank our sponsors, of course, because Zebra and Samsung and those guys there, they provided a lot of the products that we utilized. And so, yes? What was the kind of ERP system that you were using? It was called Asset Suite. And it's, uh, it's, it was made for the nuclear industry. It's very detailed and very rigid. Let's put it that way. So. Uh, it, the implementation, the integration portion was the part that took the very longest, by far. Would you not agree with that, Frank? Yes, sir. And Brett? So I don't want to give one thing. When we did our full physical, I was a little concerned because we were bringing people in from other locations and stuff. And barcoding, Brett and Levi were there and they helped us actually in the tagging process. Um, and in making sure that our inventories were right along with our local IT people. So I'm going to give them kudos for that because not all suppliers do that. They'll, they'll come in and say, oh, you need to do this, but they don't actually get involved and help you figure out the best way to do it, always. Any other questions? because you were a lot more accurate. Um, it, it, there is, but to, to track that from a metric. So the question was, was there a value in the parts that, that you were not tracking that you would potentially lose that would affect reliability, correct? 
So the problem with that is trying to track that as a metric in this case scenario because even though we did see an increase in our efficiency around uptime on our machines and stuff, which is dollars, because that's if you don't make product, you don't sell it, and that means lost customers or whatever. But to track that and identify it directly to this one project, it was very difficult to do. Although I think the biggest benefit from it overall was from the, the response from our art maintenance and operating personnel. Because traditionally, people do not like change. Especially those who've been doing this for 30 years, right? They don't, well, how come I gotta do this now? And we won those people over. They saw the value in this and they saw the ease. And I think that's the key. We made it as easy as possible for them to succeed. Easier than what they were doing before and gave them some confidence that our inventory was correct. And I think that's the key. That's what made it very successful. Stan, what about, can you speak a little bit about your site and your location or in general about the team you were working with, you know, to make that leap to a wireless tracking technology from a, you know, having a team, an MRO store team to moving to a fully self-automated, you know, check-in, check-out system. That, that's a pretty big leap, you know, for, for a large company to make that transition. W was there experience with RFID or how, how did that happen? So the only, the only experience I had had is we had used it some limitedly in um, tracking trailers in a um, logistics manner, and that was it. Since we have implemented it in this fashion, they're actually looking at it on our finished goods now also, um, plus spreading it through the MRO section for the, rest of the for the rest of the facilities, both large and small. As far as the team itself, I think again, the key was involving, especially our union leadership early, so that they realized that this was not a threat to their members, and I think that was a key. Instead, that this was gonna help and benefit them, because even though there's sometimes tensions between union and management, they still want the site to be successful, because they benefit from that. And they realized that, and saw the value, saw that we wanted their input, wanted their feedback, and that it was very important to us that, that they gave it, and that we listened to it, because two or three of the ideas came out of them. We didn't think of them up front. They came up with them. And when they saw that, we said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And added it to the project, um, it sold it to them. And I think that's the key. You gotta, you gotta sell it to the end user. You can sell it to management all you want, and they can see the dollar value that's, that it could bring. But if the end user does not accept it, it will not fly. Very good. Thank you so much, folks. Let's show some appreciation for Stan. Stan the man. We are just going to take a